So I, I put that you. just because, hey, you should know who these people are, but no one knows those people half the time. Well, I'm, I'm sort of like, I, I stay out of the pop culture thing anyway. So I, yeah. I would be the last person to ask <laughs> who, who some of these folks are. It's funny, like <laughs> some of the more notable people are just in my normal portfolio now. Like yeah. it's, it's, it's just people, you know? I hear you. So uh, how, how are you doing during these times? Like, what are, you, what are you getting done? Are you able to get out and do any of your personal work, like the street work or, or what, are you, what are you up to? Yeah, you know, it's, it's um, not the best of times, I guess, to be a photographer or even a, a creator, you know? I mean, at the same time though, uh, it's, it's unlocking a lot of different uh, opportunities and possibilities for content creation going forward. Um, I've been shooting uh, very spare client work here and there. Um, I live just outside of DC, so I'm in Virginia and we're supposed to start the reopening process next Friday, according to our governor. Um, so with that starting, like as of yesterday, I've gotten three or four already inquiries about doing shoots. So as soon as like the word came down that we might be reopening, people are already trying to get work done, which is, that's cool. You know, um, I've been doing a, sh uh, a couple days with the Washington ballet. Um, we've been going out to these what are normally very, very difficult places to shoot, very populated with people uh, doing these beautiful ballerina portraits with them wearing their masks and whatnot. And it's just kind of a cool setting. Like the shot we did yesterday was in front of the National Cathedral, which I don't know, it, it's either, there's too many people there or security would just kick you out. But being able to sit down in front of it and take our time and set up all my giant lights and take a picture right. was pretty neat. And I got a pretty cool you know, photo out of it. So there's, there's pros and cons to all of this, I think. So do they hassle you about uh, permits and things right now? or Oh, yeah. Typically, yes. Yeah. So yesterday, like... it wasn't even a big deal. Like, the cops walked up to us. They're wearing their masks. I asked them what time they're scrubbing in for surgery to make a joke, make them laugh. Right. And they laughed and said, have a good time, and just walked away, and it was fine. Like, it was no big deal. And then the, the second photo we did was actually in the middle of a, a busy crosswalk, and there was no cars coming through. Like, it was fine. It was just, you could just do, it's kind of like the whole city is a playground for photo shoots now. <laughs> Which is which is kind right. of neat, yeah. but you know, given the circumstances, it's not the best way of doing it. So, uh, are you hiring any models, or are you just working on assignment stuff like the Washington Ballet, or, or just or... on assignment stuff um, and trying to do my own personal projects, uh, just to stay creative? Because it's really easy to just fall into a well. I guess there's no work to do, so I guess I'll just sit at home. But you know, my career and most of my portfolio, honestly, is based off of personal projects. So I need to be shooting. That's, that's like how people are freaking out about getting their hair cut and going to the gym and all that stuff. Like for me, I need to be shooting and, you know, creating stuff. Right. So I've just been trying to as much as I can. So you said a lot of your, your commercial work is based on your, your personal projects. How is that? I mean, are, do you shoot and sell later or are you assigned or, or how, how, are you, how are you working that? No, I mean, a lot of the work that I'm hired for, uh, doesn't really fall in line with the type of work that I like to produce, unfortunately. And that's just kind of the, the you know, the world of a commercial photographer. Uh, so the way I, I find most of my work is I'm creating personal projects. I'm shooting it constantly and I'm sending those out to ad agencies. I'm sending those out to prospective clients saying, hey, I took the initiative to create this whole thing without any, you know, need, uh, uh, client necessity. Mm -hmm. I think I would work well with you guys. And they see that, that if I take, if someone's taking the drive, the initiative to put together a shoot that actually costs money, production value, bringing on a team, assistance, you know, more, all that stuff. And, you know, the likelihood of being hired for a gig is, is pretty high. Right. Um, you know, I would say my website's probably, you know, 60, 40 personal work with client work. Nice. Uh, okay. So it's just, you know, it's, it's the, the, the personal work is like the gateway to the paid work. And then the paid work is the gateway back to the personal work because you get the money to produce those type of things. Right, right. All right. Well, it looks like it's uh, 12.04, so let's go ahead and uh, get this started. Um, cool. Let's see. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's discussion about cinematic lighting with Jonathan Thorpe. Uh, my name is Thomas Petswinkler, and I'm a DC-based landscape and documentary photographer, as well as video production manager for Focus on the Story. So... Um, Today's talk will, well, real fast, let's get some uh, house cleaning out of the way. Today's talk will be uh, streaming on Facebook as well. Um, also, let's see, um, we're going to have a Q&A time at the end of the show. So 
use the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, you can use the chat function, but the likelihood of us actually catching your question coming by is very low. So please try to use the Q&A uh, button in the Zoom window. Um, let's see. Now, add that out of the way, I'm gonna introduce the guest. Uh, today, we have Jonathan Thorpe. He's a DC area-based cinematic photographer whose technical ability to light and direct a story rings true in the images he produces. Uh, his approach drums emotion, yet maintains a level of verisimilitude in the form of hyper-realistic portraiture. Since switching to photography in 2008 from a profession in optometry, Jonathan shoots full-time nationally, as well as in the Washington, D.C. area. He's currently a Tamron image master, and alongside his photography, Jonathan teaches and lectures around the world, helping other photographers grow confident in their careers and forays into photography. Now, that said, I forgot to put that screen up, but here we go, John. Hey. I'm gonna let you take over. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I'll just share my screen here real quick. And there we go. That should be full screen, is that right? Looks yep. okay? Okay. Cool, so before I get started, I just wanna say thank you to folks in the story for allowing me to be involved here, and thank you to Tamron for always uh, supporting me in my career and allowing me to Know, create the images I create they, they've been a huge help for me and I really believe in the product and I think their, their lenses are awesome uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about cinematic portraits and I know that's kind of a very uh, buzzword if you would say that way um, but what, what to me it is what, what it is to me is I never go into a shoot with just the idea of taking a picture of someone on the wall and calling it a day um, the majority of my work is environmental portrait and taking into consideration the environment as well as the subject. I'm gonna say this a lot today, and that is whenever you go into a shoot, there's always two subjects. There's your actual subject, which you're there to photograph, which that could be a person, it could be um, uh, you know, a product, anything like that, whatever your actual assigned subject is. And then the other part of that is gonna be the environment that they're in, and that also deserves your attention as far as composition and lighting. Uh, using, taking uh, that approach to, to your photos, will allow you to kind of create moods and feelings and atmospheres in your shots that you hadn't really thought of before. And I do all that with lighting and lens choice. Uh, we're gonna go into a little bit of each one as far as what these terms mean. And then we're gonna go through each photo and I'm gonna go through you know, different light setups all the way up to I believe the most I have in my portfolio or in this presentation is six lights on a single shot and uh, kind of go from there. Now something else to consider in my shots, uh, everything you're gonna see here uh, is no more than probably five minutes in Photoshop. And that's usually just a, a color balance, maybe a little boost in contrast and some sharpening and that's it. Um, I tend to not can be concerned with uh, Photoshopping out details. I wanna make sure I get as much of it right in the camera and I kinda go from there. Uh, and that's why I decided to go down this whole cinematic portrait uh, lighting route in my career. Uh, funny story, and this is, this is very true, I don't know how to take a natural light photo. I can't walk outside and take a picture and be happy with it. I don't know how to do it. I started my photography career with lighting and I would take action figures and I would hold little flashlights around their heads and that's how, I did, that's how I learned how to light portraits. And I would take those same ideas with my friends with little speed lights and kind of just build up my, my, um, my style from there. So for me, when I go into a shoot, I'm almost approaching it more like a cinematographer than I am a true photographer because I can, I can take the picture, that's fine. But I'm trying to create an emotion and a mood and a feeling in that same environment that may not already be present. I'm gonna change the way it's lit. I'm gonna change the color of the room. I'm gonna change everything I can to both fit the narrative of the photo and to you know, satisfy my uh, creative needs as well in creating some type of feeling and emotion. So that being said, we'll hop into this pretty quick here. So this, this, the, the term cinematic lighting, cinematic portraits, all these things, it all kind of falls under this other thing called hyper-realism. Um, what does that mean? It's a style of shooting that incorporates multiple light sources on both subject and background, which is what I kind of just talked about, uh, to create an enhanced look that can often come across as animated or quote-unquote hyper-realistic. Typically, this is found in a lot of commercial shoots. You've seen a lot of these styles before. It's usually very contrasting, has an almost over-sharpened look. And that over-sharpened look is, is a result of the lighting. Whenever you light things in a certain way, you're gonna cause what's called micro shadows on people's skin. I tend to light from a 45 degree angle down the straight front of the face, 
which then will show every little nook and cranny in their skin and kind of build out all these wrinkles and different cool textures and skin. Uh, editing and color tone play a big role. However, I don't want to rely on that when I'm shooting. Kind of what I talked about a minute ago, uh, I don't ever go into a shoot with the, the idea of, I'll just fix it later. I want to get as much right as I can on set, because for me, that's the fun part. That's the exciting part is creating a set, creating a feel, creating an emotion in the shot, and then going home and seeing what I got to do and just doing little tweaks to kind of really hit that emotion or that feeling home. Uh, we're gonna look at one, two, I think I said it, all the way up to six lights in a single shot. So what do you use to do these type of things? Well, obviously lighting and lens uh, choice plays huge roles. Depending on the scene you're creating, typically two light sources are needed and you can add more from there to enhance the look. Now, I know I made the comment that I don't know how to take a natural light photo, which is, is true, but I will utilize the sun as a second light to a strobe that I have on set already. So then in essence, I'm looking at the sun as one light, usually a kicker or a hair light, and then my light as the uh, key light. So it's a two light setup using the sun as one of those uh, light sources. Modifiers, modifiers uh, can play a big role in your final product, uh, product too. Smaller mods create a more focused light while larger is a more, uh, larger, more broad uh, modifiers is a more pleasing light. Uh, I tend to fall into the category of shooting with smaller modifiers. Uh, I like very focused, hard, punchy light. And you'll notice as I talk today, I'm gonna be drawing on the actual images on here so I can show you a little bit better where the light sources are. But something that I always do is I'm gonna get that light source as close as I can uh, to my subject. The closer I can get it, there's, and there's two beneficial reasons. One, the light's gonna be softer because you can turn the power down because you're getting it so close. And two, you're gonna start to see the actual effects of that modifier uh, the closer that the, it is to the subject. There's a reason we use modifiers. There's a reason we use a beauty dish over a soft box, over an umbrella, blah, blah, blah. They all have different uh, ways of shaping and adding characteristics to the light. But as soon as we start pulling those further and further away from our subject, we lose that and we just start getting just blank, flat light. So I wanna get it as close as I can to my subjects so I see the effects of those modifiers and it allows me to kind of sculpt faces and sculpt scenes a little differently. Uh, I tend to shoot mostly, most of my work with a mid to wide angle lens. I think there's only one photo in my presentation that's shot with an 85. Everything else is about between 24 and 60, all below that. And that's simply because I'm shooting environmental portraits and the environment is important in the shot. And if I'm shooting everything tight, I'm either gonna get a too blurry background where we can't really see where the subject is, or it's gonna just be simply too tight to them where I can't see the, the, um, the environment the subject's in. So I shoot typically 35, 45, 60, because it shows just enough of the environment around the person, but, and it's, and, but it's also not showing too much where I'm losing the subject in the shot. Okay, now locations, where is this best used? You're gonna see a lot of my stuff is not studio-based. I think I have two or three shots in the portfolio that's actually in a studio. Uh, everything else, again, is all environmental, but we, just because we're in a studio doesn't mean we can't shape and form light and create a mood and a feeling, right? Uh, so shooting this way is mostly useful on location, especially outside. The important thing to remember is we're never just lighting a subject in a space. We talked about that when we go into a shoot. Uh, something that I do that's a little bit different than I think most photographers is I light things back to front. I don't ever set, my key light is the last light to go up. Uh, I've often wondered why I did this for, for many years and it finally kind of clicked. I grew up, my mother's a painter, and when you paint, you lay one layer of paint down, you kind of build off it that way. So I guess that was my first um, foray into creative or being creative in arts and whatnot. So it just translated into photography and it makes sense for me because the environment is so important to my shot. Also by setting up the key light last, that means I've gotten everything else set up perfectly. So when my subject does show up, it's a couple of test shots and they're out the door and ready to go. If I was setting up the key light first and I was trying to figure out the, the room lights and things like that, that's just gonna make the subjects that they're longer and I don't want a shoot to last any longer than two hours ever. I don't think any of my shoots in my career have gone over two hours. I'm usually on a 15 to 20 minute, let's shoot and get out of here schedule. Uh, utilize everything around you and make thoughtful decisions about the story you're going to tell. These aren't just typical portraits. These aren't just, you know, a model on a fence. These are shots that we have thought about, conceptualized and tried to create some type of feeling in. So it's more of a narrative uh, image than it is a, you know, simply a model or, or whatnot. That being said, we're gonna jump right into one light. I shoot with the Westcott FJ400 strobes. 
awesome strobes, very small, compact, easy to travel with, a lot of power output. Uh, using off-camera flash is a very effective tool in creating a cinematic shot. Incorporating the sun or other ambient light sources is uh, often where creating that mood comes from. So anything that I talk about today can be done with a speed light, with constant light, with a cheap $20, you know, Home Depot light, whatever you're gonna use. Light is light. The camera doesn't know where the light's coming from. It just knows that light is present. So whatever you can use to create some type of artificial off-camera light, go for it. For me, strobe works because I need that power output. And I wanna modify that light in ways so I can create different types of uh, lighting characteristics on my subjects. So we'll jump right into our first shot. This is a single light with no other light sources. So this is basically as simple as it gets, you know. Um, we have just the a typical, you know, normal shot. Uh, in this, we have a, a beauty dish just above out of uh, frame. Wait, no, I'm sorry, it was a Fotex soft lighter. Uh, the Fotex soft lighter is a umbrella that is a shoot, it's a reflective umbrella. You shoot into it, and it has a, um, a diffusion panel on the outside of it. I'm gonna draw here on the shot so we can see where exactly I'm talking about. And that's just over her head, right about here, just barely out of frame, and that's putting light down this way. That's the only light in the shot. I didn't use a reflector under her chin. I just wanted to draw something right there, or just wanted to put the, the source right there to cast a nice shadow down her face. Now, the reason we're doing it, we shot this in my backyard. This is just on a ivy covered, uh, covered fence. We used a little bit of fog to kind of enhance the mood and feeling. And then in post, all I'm doing is just pushing the tones to a more blue area, just to kind of give that cold, uh, you know, eerie kind of dark feeling. And that's it, out the door, ready to go. So we're just managing the light. And the reason we're getting such a beautiful, soft, interesting light is because that source is so close to our subject. So I'll clear this out and we'll move on, whoops, to our next shot. Now this time, it's a single light source again. Now the only difference here is I'm using a single light source while maintaining the ambient light in the room. This is shot in a, a hotel in Colorado. I was there for a project, had a couple extra days, met up with a model and said, hey, let's do something that I'm here, that, that I enjoy shooting. So hey, in John, this shot- Can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, sure. Uh, you had a question and I thought it was a pretty good one. Uh, what did you yeah. use for the eye lighter? Uh, say it one more time. What did you use for the eye lighter? In the and last from Michael uh, Stern, shot, by the way. One second, oops, I'll go back to it so I have it up. So you mean down here? Yes. That is just done in post. That's just okay. a little bit of highlight brought in the eye. I did not put anything underneath the, uh, the chin there. Thanks, Jonathan. Sure. Okay, so we're back here. So again, what we're trying to do here is we want to if I, if I was to take this shot without any of the speed, and this time I'm using a speed light versus a, um, a strobe because I was on travel. If I was to take this shot without any of my artificial light hitting, the only thing we're gonna see is these lamps. So I wanna make sure I get those lamps to show up in our photo first. And I'm balancing the entire shot for just those lamps. And this is kind of a tricky thing. If I had more lights with me, I would physically, physically probably put some type of light sources in those lamps to kind of take the the thought out of it a little bit more because it's, it's a tricky balance to get just the lamp lights in the room and whatnot. And then right over ahead, we have another, we have a soft box. It's a very small little folding soft box. And that's just right overhead. And we're, we're casting it so it does darken out her eyes. We want it to fall just on the top of her, her head right here. And we want that shadow to fall straight down, kind of add again to that mysterious kind of look. So two photos, similar in nature as far as the feeling of them and the toning but two different ways of using that same single light setup, one using ambient light as well to influence the shot and one just using the only uh, artificial light in the room or in the, on the location. Okay, so this time we're doing a single light again, obviously, and now we're doing it, using it outside with high speed sync. For those of you who don't know what high speed sync is, typically our cameras have sync speeds and that is one two hundredth of a second or one 250th of a second, somewhere in those ranges. And those are the, the, the shutter speeds that a flash can uh, fill the frame with light before the shutter gets in the way. Uh, high speed sync allows your camera to go past that up to, depending on the flash, uh, you're using one 8,000th of a second. And the benefit of that is you get to kind of expose for sky and get your blue skies and your details and your shots. So in this, all we're doing is exposing for the sky. We again have a small, 
uh, soft box just above frame, and that's angled straight down like before. That's that same 45 degree angle right here on top of the head. And the reason we're getting this amazing detail in his face is it's causing those things called those micro shadows that I mentioned earlier. Once the light kind of hits in a spot and cascades down, every little uh, wrinkle is going to have a shadow that goes with it. So you see a really, really cool texture and detail in someone's skin. Obviously, it's not the most beautiful, <laughs> but we're not going for that. We're going for over-textualized, um, hyper-realistic shot. This was taken in New Jersey at a motorcycle race that I uh, participate in. And, you know, it's just filled with characters and you can't really take a bad portrait. Everyone there is kind of just very, very interesting to look at. We'll go past this one kind of quick. So I want to get to the other shots later on. This is a similar thing. This is a single light. The only difference here is we have the sun low and behind. We can see it catching his ear, uh, his right ear. Uh, and we're using that, um, th that sun as our second light source here. So it's, it's adding, it's, it's, it's a kicker light. And it's giving us a nice hard highlight around the side of his face. And it's giving some light into his hair. The single light stuff is not the most interesting, but we're gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll get through them quick and we'll, we'll jump into the more complex stuff here. So this time we're outside again. Uh, cloudy days are typically the best times to shoot portraits. We all kind of know that it's very flat, soft, pleasing light. And typically you don't really have to use strobe when you're outside on a cloudy day because you have such a nice, even balance of light. But what if you want that subject to stand off of that balanced light, just a touch, and help them uh, stand off of the background? This was shot in Idaho uh, during some pretty gnarly uh, wildfires that were going on. Uh, she was one of the firefighters on the scene and we were driving up a mountain to take some pictures of it. And all I'm doing here, honestly, is trying to avoid pushing my shadows in post and getting them right in the camera. So I'm just shooting for the shadows here in the tree line because I don't want to deal with that later in post. So all these dark areas, I just want to make sure that those are showing up first. And then I want to fill in some shadows here on her face. And I just use that with a small, with two speed lights into a single uh, softbox, boomed way overhead. Uh, and you can see a little bit of hot spot right here on her helmet that kind of shows you where my light source is from. And the rest of it just kind of falls into place. It's a very simple, simple light. But the thing to take away from this is just because it's outside and it's cloudy doesn't mean you can't create some type of other emotion in the shot. So even though that those pleasing uh, flat light, still bring a strobe out, still bring a speed light out and try to create something that looks a little bit more interesting and still stands out uh, from the background. And this time we're using a single hard light. Now that we're using a beauty dish this time. Beauty dishes are typically used in beauty photography as the name says. Uh, it's a very hard hitting contrasty light that kind of uh, for lack of a better term, exploits anything on the skin. So if there's any imperfections, it will show up. For me, that's right in my wheelhouse of the things that I like to shoot and like to show. So I want to show all that rich skin detail and all that rich skin tone and wrinkles and whatnot. For, so for a portrait of a guy like this that has such an interesting face, it totally makes sense. Another thing to look at, all the shots that I've shown have been either 35 or 45, maybe a 24, but nothing really, really tight. The one shot with the sun behind the ear, that was the only thing I believe that's in my portfolio that's an 85 mil. Everything is 45, everything is 35. I wanna show the environments, I wanna show a little bit around them, I wanna show a normal uh, view of them, if not a little exaggerated on the wide angle, because it, it, it complements my lighting very, very well. In this, we're using just a 45 mil, uh, which is pretty standard, you know, focal length. That beauty dish has given us that really hard, contrasty, defining light, and it creates this really kind of otherworldly, interesting portrait. All right, moving into two lights. So adding another light can help you with storytelling in lots of different ways. That second light can be used as a rim or a background or a room light. Balancing different levels of your flash output will also add some dimensionality to your photos. Something I want to do in all of my shots is I want them to come out and look almost three-dimensional. Like the viewer can look into the photo as opposed to looking at the photo. There's always a lot of details in it. And as we get further down the, the uh, presentation with more and more light, you're gonna start to see how I start to build giant sets up using lots and lots of light. Okay, so this is two very large soft lights. Uh, let me bring the pen up here. So our main light is a large uh, octobank and that's a uh, very, very, you know, I think it was a six foot or seven foot large um, octobank that's sitting right here just out of frame. Okay, 
and that's going to just light up her face and whatnot. From there, I want to make sure we're not getting too dark on the side of her face. So she has this beautiful cheekbone. I want to make sure that we see all of that. Now I could set up a reflector and the reflector is going to take any of that spill from our key light and bounce it back into the subject. And that works fine. Uh, I don't really have a way to set up reflectors on set. If I don't have an assistant, then I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of screwed. So I want to set up another light. I want to balance these two lights. So just acting as the rim light is a six foot parabolic, which is a little bit different than the Octabank in that it's a reflective. So it's going to go into the umbrella and then come back out with a much, much softer light. And all I'm doing is trying to light up these little details here in the neck in the jawline, the cheekbone, and just a little bit on the shoulder. I'm just in some of the hair too. So only thing I want that light affecting is this area right in here. And the shadows can fall off on the arm. That's fine with me. Just want to bring up a little bit more here. So I just don't lose her, her skin and her neck and her hair into the background. I wanted this to stand out just a little bit, but I don't really give, I don't really care too much about the arm. I want to make sure that we're seeing the face and we're seeing all that to stand off of the, uh, the backdrop. Clear that out and cool. All right, so this is two light sources this time. I call this one soft and one focused. And the reason I say that is one of the lights is modified with a, uh, a modifier, which is a small octabank. Uh, I tend, if you see again, I use the same lighting uh, modifiers over and over and over. So once I know those characteristics, then I trust them more and more. They're always usually pretty small because I don't want huge, you know, giant. Uh, octabanks on set that are going to blow over. That means they got to bring sandbags. That means they got to bring assistants. Usually kind of a one-man uh, band, if not having a assistant or a BTS guy there. So that small octabank is simply right here overhead. I'm not a good drawer, so I apologize in advance. My mom was the painter, not me. That's why I take pictures. <laughs> and uh, back here, we have just a bare bulb that is a, um, just a little reflector on it, another strobe. And that's gelled warm, and that's just hitting a little bit of light this way. And you can see the effects of that light right here in the hair. We want to show that just to be a little bit of sunlight. And we're kind of using that strobe to create a sun vibe in the shot. Uh, this was late, late, late day, probably, you know, 7 o'clock. Sun's just about gone. Uh, we had to travel really far to this sunflower field. We just did not plan for the, the light accordingly. So we had to create our own sunlight. So we just, again, you take a small just a strobe back here, let it hit the back of the subject. It creates a nice dimensionality in the shot. You get some beautiful shadows that fall from the, uh, the sunflowers as well. And then you have another light, this is the key light, just filling in the shadows on her face. That helps her all stand out from all the sunflowers uh, around the shot. And clear this out. All right, so I talk about this photo a lot. And this is, I've done a lot of different presentations and I always make sure this photo is in it because I wish we could have a direct back and forth um, on this because I call this one of the biggest mistakes in my portfolio and I own up to it and it's, it is what it is. So what this shot is, this is shot in uh, Las Vegas. I was there uh, presenting for WPPI. Uh, and afterwards we have some downtime. So I wanted to do some personal work. We walked down to Fremont street and while we're walking, we came across this garage with this old car and this cool awning with these neat lights. And, you know, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to shoot there. So I, I contacted the model and we set it all up. So why do I call this a big mistake? Well, the title of this is influencing the ambient. If there are light sources in your photo, whatever they may be, you have to pay attention to how those light sources would be affecting your subject. In this shot, if we look at our scene, we have a light source here and a light source up here. Okay. The light source, the secondary light source, this, this white light, we see it affecting the car. We see it hitting, let me draw that a little better. We see it hitting all the way here. Okay. That's all from that overhead light. The way that I let the portrait, I looks like, I mean, the, the portrait's well lit, it's, it's interesting but I lit it backwards. And I'm gonna say that if you notice this giant bright highlight here on the side of her face and on the back of her arm and even here, that highlight should probably be on the other side because it would be affected by this light overhead. That light would be causing that bright highlight because we see those bright highlights on the car as well. So anytime that there's an influence of ambient light in your subject, I'm sorry, in your, in your environment, 
make sure it's going to hit your subject in the same way just to make it a little bit more believable. Now the photo itself is fine. I like the shot. I'm happy it's in my portfolio, but in my brain, every time I look at it, now I see that inverse light and you guys probably see that inverse light now too. And I should have that bright highlight right here down her arm as opposed to uh, on the other side. Now, if I was going to get really fancy and I had more equipment with me, I would gel a light that was a little bit more green tone, have that hitting right here and really try to influence that ambient and really kind of sell it as a, as a, as a, as a cohesive image. But you know, midnight in Vegas, you just want to kind of get in, get out. <laughs> and uh, you know, had I just flipped the lighting, I think it would be a little bit more of a believable uh, shot. It's a nitpicky thing, but I'm very particular about stuff. <clears throat> okay, so this is a more studio-based shot. And this is what I call two into three. This is taking two lights and making them look as if you have three lights in your shot. What we've done here is place a seven-foot parabolic as our background. And that parabolic umbrella is shooting straight to the camera, uh, straight to me, and behind the model. What happens is you get this really kind of uh, beautiful uh, rim lighting and, 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 and whatnot. You see it kind of falling right here, and it's over here on the side of the face, and it's right here in the collarbone area and the neck. And it's just beautiful wrapping light. And typically you would get that by using two strip boxes on either side. I use those strip boxes a lot in my work. But by just having that one giant light, it wraps her in light, and then all we're doing at that point is just filling in the shadows, and we're using that now with the beauty dish right overhead. And that's just gonna fill in those shadows of the eyes, fill in the shadows of the, um, the face and whatnot. And just, uh, it competes with that background light. Competing light sources tend to give a, a, a more uh, three-dimensional look. So this can be done with uh, a white sheet, shower curtain, anything you got that's a, a, you know, a translucent fabric that you can fire a light through, you'll get the same shot. It's kind of a tricky thing to balance and to get it just right, but you know, with practice it comes. We probably did a hundred test shots to try to get this thing just right because that background light is tricky. But once you get it, it's it's real, real easy and you can really create some some really cool stuff with a very, very small setup. This is, can be done in your living room, especially now with us all being quarantined and stuck at home. You can create a really interesting three-dimensional shot just by firing light back at into the camera and creating your own, uh, essentially your own backdrops, really. So, you know, it looks like you shot it on a, legitimate psych wall in a studio. Okay, so this time our second light source is behind the, the, the ballerina here. And we're using that second light source just to create drama and mood in our shot. And this is when I start to create feeling and emotion in photos. Uh, I get a lot of questions about where this was shot. And to a lot of people, they always say, it looks like it was shot on a stage or, or whatnot. This is actually shot uh, during a blizzard in uh, DC. And this is a major highway that was pretty much shut down for the night. Uh, the other lights you see in the background are cars and street lights. And I dragged this poor ballerina out to take this photo. We did it quick, you know, she was in a coat the whole time. But what's important is we're just using that background light to show the snow and to kind of create this beautiful uh, shadow to camera. So it looks like stage light. And we're doing this on location in an environment and we're shooting it outdoors in the elements. And it kind of also has this like snow globe feel to the whole thing. So if you can look right behind her, you can see a little bit of that light influence coming from behind. That's just a bare strobe and it's right here at this horizon line. That's straight to camera. And then boomed way, way overhead. This is one of the few times where I don't have the light source uh, close to my subject because I'm trying to create more of a backlight than a front light. Boom, way overhead is another umbrella. It's the Fotex Soft Flatter, which if you guys don't know what that is, uh, it's, it's a very flat uh, umbrella with a reflective surface and it shoots in and comes out. A lot of photographers use them because it gives this beautiful kind of like painter uh, look to your shots. That's boom right overhead and that's just kind of falling down. And we're just using that very, very, on a very, very low power setting uh, just to build up, just to bring up those shadows in her. So again, I don't want to push shadows too much in post. Um, and then we're shooting this with a wider lens at 35 millimeter because we want to show that background. Um, had I shot this low to the ground and tight, we would lose that whole feeling of the snow. But being able to see a little bit of snow here on the ground, uh, you know, we see the shadow coming to the camera, it creates this 3D look. 
And it's a, it's kind of a neat thing to look at when you just kind of take it all in and you realize, oh my gosh, it's actually snow and that's not shot in studio and that's not shot in a, in a stage. So it's taking stage elements and stage ideas and studio elements and ideas and taking them outside to create a very, a very moody kind of interesting shot. Whoops. Okay, and this time we're using our second light again as a practical light. Uh, and when I say a practical, we're using it to influence the scene and not necessarily the subject. Uh, this portrait was taken on a day where it was, a, it was cloudy but sunny at the same time, and the clouds would always roll in and we'd have to stop shooting, and the cloud would roll in and stop shooting. So we finally just got tired of it and set up another light and made that our, our fake sunlight. If we look right over here over her shoulder, we have a little bit of it bleeding in, and that's simply just a, uh, was a speed light that we put out of frame a little bit of a warming gel on it and let that kind of hit into the camera. We see that influence here on her arm and in her hat. And that's just, honestly, it's, it, it fits the mood of the shot. It's a beautiful spring day. We want those sunbeams. We want those flares in the camera because it kind of adds this whole warm, you know, uh, early June photo. Um, and we just got kind of tired of waiting every 10 seconds for the clouds to move by because it would be cloudy and then it wouldn't be. So we got tired of waiting. We set up our own shot and made our own sun without the clouds being there. Yeah. We would have that same sun kind of peeking in, but we want to make our own. We want to create that ourselves and not have to make the client wait. So by setting up another light, we can then create that same feeling and that same uh, mood as we would without that light and not just having to wait on the sun. Uh, one of the main reasons I like to shoot with strobe and whatnot is I don't want to be stuck with dealing with the elements. If it's a cloudy day and I want it to be sunny, I can make it do that. If it's raining outside, I can make it do that too. I can create different types of weather environments, honestly, using strobes. And that's, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. And it, it makes um, shooting on set a little bit easier when you don't have to deal with elements and things like that, when you can create uh, anything with your light, it makes, it makes shoots go a little bit smoother, I feel like. So I just added this frame into the presentation. This is a newer portrait. Um, this is two lights with what I call a fog influence. Uh, one of the things that I can't live without in my, my camera bag now is stuff, it's called atmosphere spray, it's fog spray. It's, it looks like a can of hairspray and you can just get a fog out of it. Um, if anyone's ever tried powering a fog machine on set, on location is very difficult. It takes a lot of power to power those things. So this is just something I can toss in my bag and create some extra atmosphere in, in, in the frame. This is shot in the bell tower of the National Cathedral uh, here in Washington, DC, which is a beautiful, beautiful, interesting location. This was for, I forget the name of the magazine. It was a whole uh, story on this gentleman here, Paul. So in it, I'm gonna draw, cause these lights do get a little complicated. So way boomed out ahead out here is again, our, our small octa, okay? And that's boomed pretty much directly over and down. And that's lighting up his face right here. The next light is we have a strip box and strip boxes are tall, skinny, uh, soft boxes that kind of focus the light to one area, but it also provides it to be long and soft. And that is just out of frame right here, okay? And that light is giving us this right there. Now, I talked about it earlier with that the Vegas shot, making sure the ambient light sources in your photo are influencing uh, your subject. In the background, we see this little, I don't know what you would call it, like a little porthole light. And I wanted that light to seem as if this was, if, as it, the light, I'm sorry, I wanted the light on his shoulder to look as if it was being influenced by this. So to avoid losing this totally, I use, simply use that fog spray again, put a little bit of it, just a little blast around the light that gives it that beautiful haze that I take my shot. And now when we see the shot, we see this haze and we see the influence right here on our shoulder and we kind of put all the pieces together in our heads and say, well, that light must be from there as opposed to just a random light source that would happen to be in, in the room, you know? Uh, it just it adds just a tiny bit more of atmosphere. It adds a tiny bit more of, of feeling and mood to the shot. But it's those little details that will get you hired. It's those little details that make you stand out. When you're that OCD about things, you know, uh, it, it just helps create that cool, interesting shot. And, it, it, you know, you don't lose everything. You don't lose those details. You know, it's just 
you're paying attention to your framing, you're paying attention to your shot, you're slowing yourself down a little bit. And I think it, it really adds, you know, to the overall feel and uh, emotion of the shot. All right, so we're getting into three lights and more. And this is when we start getting to really big light setups. Um, using this main lights gives you the ability of lighting large rooms or scenes, or use your maximum lights to bring out details in your subject and sculpt them with light. We're gonna start using a three light setup where we're wrapping our subject in light, similar to that two into three, I'm sorry, the three into two setup. Uh, this time we're actually gonna use three sources and we're gonna show all the way up to six. So we'll start right here. Now, as complicated as this looks, it's actually a very, very simple uh, shot to, to figure out. This is the band Real Big Fish. It's my favorite band. I've been friends with these guys for I think seven or eight years now. I've been shooting their work and their promotional material. Uh, so when I get to the set and I get on scene and I've, I've already scouted the location, everything's kind of done. You know, this, is, this is the last step of the process. I want to find what's important to me in the subject, or not in the subject, in, in the shot. And for me, the important part of this shot was that dark, moody sky. I want to make sure I could see that. So my first frame is a pretty much blacked out scene with a building silhouette in that sky. And I'm there, I'm, from there, I'm going to start building lights up. Now I'm going to start this back to front again. Okay. So I'm going to try my best to draw it because it's kind of tricky to, to figure this out, uh, but drawing it on the actual frame. The first slide I'm starting with is the building light and that building light is back right behind uh, the, the shorts here, right behind his body. Okay. So just imagine a light behind and that's just a bare bulb right there. And what that light's doing is hitting the corner of the building and then light's going in both directions and it's kind of cascading in both directions. And that creates that dimensionality in the building. Now the light spills pretty far down the alley, gives us some cool uh, texture and details on both sides and it falls off quick. And it almost creates a background vignette, which is kind of an interesting thing in this shot. The next light I'm gonna uh, work with is again, it's behind this guy this time. So the light behind here, that's another just bare uh, light. And that one's aimed at me. If we look at the shadows on the ground, we see where that light source is coming from. So it's right behind here and it's coming straight to camera. And that's giving us that stage light that we talked about with the ballerina shot again. Again, adding dimensionality to our shots. The next portion, the key light, the last uh, part of the equation, which for most people, again, is the first part, but for me, the last part, is a large seven foot parabolic umbrella that's kind of just barely out of frame. I'm shooting right underneath it. I'm shooting this at 24 millimeters, so pretty wide. And that light is a big enough source that it will give me enough light to cover the whole band at once. So this is a one frame, no real editing to this shot. And we're just using our different types of light to create that three dimensionality look in our photo. So to reiterate really quick, our first light goes on the back wall. That goes in either direction and cascades. Our second light is to camera just behind the band and that's gonna cause, and all that's doing is giving me those shadows and some rim light. We can see a little bit of light here, a little bit of light here, a little bit of light there. All those little tiny details that help them stand off the background. And finally, our key light just boomed out above and that is filling all those shadows in the face and lighting them up. I know that seems like a lot, but when you break it down from back to front, I think that really simplifies lighting. More often than not, you get to shoot, you light your subject up, you see where the light's falling, and you're kind of like, okay, well, now I have a really hard shadow there on the ground, or I have a really hard shot on that wall. That doesn't look really nice. So I'm eliminating those, those, those things that can pop up by lighting back to front. And it's something I recommend a lot of people try to do when they're learning how to light. I think, it, for me at least, it really does simplify things. Hey, Jonathan, so can I step in for one second? Yeah, please. Hey, everybody, um, get your questions into the question and answer box so that we have, uh, have some discussion here at the end. Uh, I noticed some good questions coming through, so uh, let's try to get some more in there. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. So this is our, our sculpting the face. Now, this goes back to that three light set up into two. This time, we're actually using three lights. And we're using two uh, strip boxes on either side of our model here. These are hitting pretty hard. I don't have the, um, the fusion panels in. These are just bare strip boxes that are hitting straight to each side. We get that really, really hard highlight and it's defining that jawline really well. And then finally, 
uh, just overhead is our small deep octa, and that's going to create. It's a very very deep octa. When I say deep octa, um, it's it's almost like a tunnel of light, and that what that does is it causes a really hard shadow underneath your chin, but it's still soft, uh, pleasing light. I am proud to say that I made these sunglasses um, uh, the same day that we were shooting, and that again that that deep uh, octa is a I mean, it's the size of, I don't even know what you would call it. It's very, very deep, but very shallow at the same time. And it just shoots light straight down the face and gives us this nice hard shadow here, uh, but, but still maintaining a soft light. And typically it's kind of hard to get a hard shadow with a soft light. It's usually a, a give or take for both of those, but by using a deep modifier like that, you do get that really kind of uh, cool soft light, but still, still hard enough to cast a, a really hard shadow. All right, three lights gelled. Oops, uh, I struggle with gels. I couldn't tell you why. I don't know what it is, but I'm not great with gels, but I try my best with them. And something I'm planning to learn more of while in quarantine. Uh, gels from here are tricky, and but they, they can create some really cool effects. Uh, in this shot, our, our first photo without any lighting is going to be just those headlights. And again, I'm using that little fog spray on those lights to kind of create those beams. Uh, then I'm using, uh, you know, just speed lights in this one, just gelled speed lights. One is camera right, one is camera left, blue and pink. Typically the, 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 the cliched or stereotypical gel colors, I feel like, that everyone likes to use right now. Um, and then our key light is just, again, that small, uh, deep octa just overhead to light their faces. I do that a lot, as you can see. Shooting this with the Tamron 45 millimeter, want to show enough of the scene to kind of get this whole bank robbery heist vibe, but not too much that we lose our subjects. We just shot this in a parking garage. Um, you can't really tell, but that is a, a case of jewels or diamonds or whatever on, on the hood there. Uh, but to me, it's just making sure we get that cool atmosphere in the headlights and then kind of building off of our lights from there. All right, so three lights outdoors with sun influence. I get a lot of questions about this portrait. Um, a lot of people ask me if it's uh, Photoshop together, if it's a composite, and it's not. This is this was shot then on set. This is all all in camera. Uh, this was done in Savannah, Georgia. I was there for South Magazine shooting their entire issue for I think it was March or something, and it fe uh, featured various portraits of people in the community. Uh, the gentleman here, his name is Jim, if you can't tell from his shirt. <laughs> um, he owns the movie theater that is behind here, and he was renovating it and uh, opened it up to the public to show like older movies and things like that. Uh, so in this, we're using, again, three lights. We have two strip boxes on either side, and that's giving us that cool light um, around his head. And the reason we did it this time this way is we did have a nice low sun behind him. And we want to make sure that that low sun that's peeking out from back here, we want to make sure that that has influence on him. This goes back to, again to that Vegas shot of uh, maintaining our ambient light to help tell our narrative. So in, in, if there was light behind the subject, it would cast some light onto it. So we want to make sure that we're seeing that. Uh, I got really nitpicky on this shot. If you look right here in the corner, there's a bit of sun bouncing off the window from that that's uh, sun that's behind him. So if we look at our modifier on this side, we notice it's not as bright as the modifier on this side. So when I was doing the lighting on this, I don't know what the power output uh, uh, outputs were because this has you know, been a little bit of a while, a little while. But this light was a tiny bit brighter than this one because again, I see that there's a an, an influence of light in the in the scene, and I want to make sure that that is just playing into our subject as well. The other question I get a lot about this photo is, how did you shoot this in the middle of the road with all this equipment? Did you have permits, blah, 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 blah. Did not have permits to do this, but I do travel with a traffic cone in my car <laughs> and we had driven down to Georgia for this shoot. And I've found that people really listen to traffic cones and we just put a traffic, a traffic cone out there and no one seemed to have a problem with it and they all thought it was official. So if you learn anything today, just learn that a traffic cone will get you pretty much everywhere you need to go. Okay, four lights with one practical. So we're getting a little bit bigger with our light setup. This is 
that similar shot with the two strip banks on either side. This is Rhett and Link. If you guys happen to watch Good Mythical Morning on YouTube, these are two of the bigger name YouTube celebrities that are out there right now. They've been around for about 10 years. We were always trying to arrange our schedules to do a shoot. They happened to be in my town, so it worked out. Um, we have those two giant, those two strip boxes on either side, and that's gonna light those side of their faces. The next, our key light here was a, a large octobank just boomed overhead. But again, if we look in the background, so they're in a movie theater. So there's things about a movie theater that should make it look like a movie theater. And typically that's gonna be your projector light. So way, way in the back, we see the light source coming to the camera right there. That's one of my strobes that's aimed right to me. And that's just simulating what would be a projector light as if they were in a movie theater watching a movie for real. And again, it just adds that last little bit of realism to our shot that helps it stand out. And it also gives us a nice hair light on top. In addition to that, we have our two strip boxes here on either side. And our background light is actually giving us that another light hitting right here on the side of their faces. So it becomes almost six lights at once. So we have one, two, three, four, five, and then key light at six. But we're using four lights to create it because that background light is such a bright hit and it cascades down these uh, chairs and it catches a little bit here on the side of their faces. So it gives a total three-dimensional look to our photo just by using what lights would typically already be there had it been a normal like working movie theater day and we were just there during a movie playing. All right, so we're getting more complicated here. This is five lights. I will say right off the bat that there is Photoshop in this image. The only Photoshop in this image is the fire. The fire, shooting fire on set is tricky. Uh, so we had to Photoshop that in. But I knew that going in to the project. When I started to do this photo, I knew that that was gonna be an issue and we planned for it. This is what I'm kind of famously known for now are my Halloween shoots. I do a big production every year for Halloween. It's my favorite holiday. I think this style fits my, my work really well. And it's just fun for me to do. Uh, the costume that we see, the monster in the background, uh, that is a real costume that we had made for us. Uh, a prop house in Tennessee, or I think it was Nashville, made that for us. The person wearing it is like six foot eight. It's a giant monster mask. And if I could, I would show it to you right now because I have it here in my office with me. So that was real. Uh, it's hard to see in a, in a smaller version. But again, if you look right here, there's a comic book that the kid's reading. And that same monster is in the the cover of the comic book. That's also real, we created that for the shot. And this whole vibe is like this Stand By Me, you know, late 80s, uh, what is it, Stranger Things kind of vibe. Kids out in the woods having to camp out, reading ghost stories. And in the photo, what's happening is like their imagination is kind of running away with them. Uh, it's like you hear the sound in the woods and like, what was that? And it turns out it's the actual monster. So in this, we have five lights. Uh, Three large parabolics are just overhead here, and that's creating just our flat, basic light in the shot. That's just illuminating what's there. We have a light back in the woods coming straight to camera, and that's gonna light up the back of the monster, light up some of the bushes, and things like that. We have a fog machine on set. Uh, this is actually taken in the backyard of my buddy's house, and we had enough extension cord to run a fog machine from his house. Uh, so about 200 yards away or something. So we do have fog throughout this shot and that's where we're getting these really cool flashlight beams from. Those aren't Photoshopped in. Those were taken with the fog machine helping us out there. So we have that, we have the background light. So four lights total. And then the last light to make all this believable in the fire pit, we put another uh, strobe here that was bare bulb gelled with a, a warming gel to cast this orange light on the kids because I knew I'd have to put fire back in later and that fire would have influence on them. Had I not thought about that, this does not look very believable. So keeping in mind what uh, your influences are in your, in your shot, your ambient influences and what those would do to your subject is very important. Because had the fire been there for real, then of course we'd get that hard light, that hard orange light on the kids. So I wanna make sure that that was uh, thought of. And to me, that's the most important part of the scene that makes it totally believable, is having that, that warm uh, tone light from underneath, because that's what would be there, and that's what we need to pay attention to. All right, six lights. This is a lot. <laughs> um, 
there's actually a video of this whole shoot on YouTube. Uh, this is done with Tamron. And I'm going to get the name wrong because I always change it in my head. It's called One Lens, One Lesson, One Location. That's probably the wrong order. But it shows the entire uh, behind the scenes of this, this shoot. So we have six lights total. Um, the first light is simply, when I say first light, we're starting back to front. I should probably clarify that. Back to front, always back to front, always back to front. So our background light is just hitting the wall back here behind, let me put my pen here. All it's doing is lighting back here. We're just getting a nice basic exposure. Had my strobes not gone off, this scene is pretty much entirely dark aside from the little menu board here. Cause I want to be able to see that light. I don't want to blow it out too much. So that light is just a bare bulb back here hitting. We can see a little bit of how hard it hits right here from a door frame, but it's just lighting up the background. That's our first, let's start from there. Second light, or I'm sorry, the next two lights, we'll do it, we're gonna go in, in layers from back to front. We have another strobe over here, out of sight, another strobe over here, out of sight. You can see a little bit of that influence there on her hair. We have a little bit of a bright spot there. Let me see the obvious more influences over here from that light. Again, that's just lighting back to front so we don't lose people on our background of our shot. Everything gets a light. Everything has to be thought of and considered. So two, we're at three lights total so far. The next lights as we come up further are gonna be two strip boxes right here. And that's lighting up our three main characters, the two girls and my buddy Ben who's playing the bowler here. You see that again, we see our influence there on her and we see our influence there on her from the hair lights. Let me get rid of some of these drawings. So it's gonna get messy real quick. Uh, those same strip boxes are also causing spill that falls onto him. So in addition to hitting here, they're also hitting him. So we have a total right now of five lights, right? No, yeah, five. So <laughs> one in the background, uh, two, three, four, five. Cool. Final light is a deep parabolic that's boomed right overhead, and that deep parabolic is gonna encompass all three of them. It's gonna light up Ben, it's gonna light up her face, it's gonna light up her face. And you see just a slightest shadow right here on the side of her face that shows the, the definition of all the light on them. And the scene is done. And this is, in that same video, I show the test shots where you can see what this looks like. There's very little editing on this. I think all I do is a white balance edit and probably a little bit of contrast and sharpening, and that was it. So we're using all of these different lights, right? It's very complicated and it's scary, but it really kind of isn't when you just break down what you're gonna use these lights for. For me, you're lighting with purpose, you're lighting with um, thought, you're creating scenes, you're creating feeling, you're creating motion. For this shot, it needed to have that kind of hard hitting light that a bowling alley would have. So we're just using that, we're just keeping that in mind as we create our lights uh, from back to front. Oops. So one last thing before we get into questions, I included these last three images for composite purposes. Compositing is a really cool thing, especially if you are limited in your locations, limited in the weather, limited in time of day for shooting. Three light setups are really wonderful. Uh, for composite work because you can wrap your subject in light and then kind of build off of that with your background. All three of these light, all, I'm sorry, all three of these photos, I've taken the background picture in addition to the subject photo. They might look a little low res because I kind of pulled these off last second, but you'll get the idea. Uh, this is my makeup artist, Jesse, who also trains as an MMA fighter. Um, so we wanted to create this kind of really harsh, cool, gritty uh, portrait of her. Uh, I ride motorcycles and I travel to a lot of different places around the country on my bike. I'd like to go to a lot of abandoned locations and take photos. And this is one of those locations behind her. I can't remember where this was. I believe this might have been in Pennsylvania. Um, but in that shot, we had this really cool, uh, beautiful light coming in from the window behind her. Uh, so I want to make sure that we have that same light influence on her. So when I shot this, I put two lights on either side, two strip boxes, boomed a octabank overhead, and it creates a believably lit uh, photo amongst the photoshopped in uh, background. Same thing happening here. Uh, this was shot again for that South Magazine project. Uh, and he was a, he's a movie director that's been featured. He was the youngest person to ever be, I think nominated for an Emmy or something like that. He's from the uh, Savannah, Georgia area. 
grew up uh, making movies in his basement as a kid. So we wanted to have this uh, sitting in front of the old movie theater feel, or not movie theater, the movie projector shot. I forgot where this background's from. I think it's from another abandoned home or something like that. Uh, but we wanted to kind of hit home that he was making movies as a child in his uh, living room or in his bedroom. Use that same three light setup. This is a real projector light. Had my assistant go off on set and find me a real working projector at the at a local um, uh, thrift store or something. And turns out it worked. So we kind of just went with it and rolled. And finally, a DJ that I shot, wanted the photo to be a very sleek, kind of cool, uh, not edgy, but just very uh, technical looking portrait, if that makes any sense. So I wanted those really cool, harsh blue tones and those cool tones. Uh, again, I don't remember where I was for this bridge shot but it works we have these we have these light sources down here below that can influence him we have the light sources from above that are also influencing him and again this is a three light setup two strip boxes over either side and then the one uh boomed overhead and i think whoops we're at the end there and that should cover all of it so if we want to jump into questions we can jump into questions and I will stop sharing my screen. Man, great presentation, Jonathan. Thanks. Um, let's Lots see. Let's, uh, here, I've got one. Uh, look, Joe Macby has a question for you. Let me let her get on and, uh, and ask it. Are you there, Joe? Hmm. They hate me. I guess. <laughs> no, here we go. No. No. Yes. You've got to un unmute her, um, Tom. Ah, that's my right. job. You've got to allow to talk, and then um, Joe has to take her mic off mute. So I'm clicking on mute over and over, and it's not working. Real quick for everybody, if my camera goes dark, it's because I had to swap out the battery, but I will still be on audio, and you'll hear me. Yeah. <laughs> It'll take two seconds to do that. Is that the R that you're using for that? That is the RP. Aha. Uh -huh. Which is, I don't, never mind, I won't say anything. <laughs> Can you plug the power bank into it through the USB-C and keep it on? Couldn't on. find one. They're all oh. sold out. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's not working. I can't get her to unmute. So I'm going to go ahead and ask. Maybe her. I have to do it. Oh, you have She's to. probably away from her, her computer. Okay. No worries. Uh, her question was, how do you go about keeping your light stands, umbrellas, booms, et cetera, out of the frame? For example, in the band photos, how do you keep the background backlighting stands out of the shot? Got it. So for that tip, that, that band photo, the band members are simply blocking those lights and they're in front of them and blocking them to frame. Um, occasionally you'll catch a little bit of a light stand at the bottom of the shot, easy to Photoshop out. I don't want to ever Photoshop stuff. I hate being at the computer. Uh, all of my key lights, when I'm shooting underneath them, I'm literally kind of pressed up against the uh, modifier. It's literally hitting me in the head or my camera lens. And that's how I can shoot so wide and not see the, uh, the key light modifiers in my frame. So how much uh, Photoshop and things like that do you also use? Do you have to clean that stuff out occasionally? Like, Yeah, it, I don't think I've ever had a photo take longer than 10 minutes to edit. Nice. Um, light stands are easy to edit out, but typically, you know, the raw photo looks a lot like what you guys are looking at today. So it's, usually, it's just little tiny things here and there. I'll do skin touch up, that's a whole other thing. But when it comes to just getting a base good photo, it's usually about 10 minutes. Gotcha. All right. Let's see. We have a question. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> we have a question from, um, where did it go? Uh, Ciara Dawn. I'm going to go ahead and un try to get this to work this time and see what happens. I've never done the question like this. This is fun. Hey, it's interesting. Um, I, but I keep clicking answer live and then things just aren't working. Oh, hold on. Here she no, is. Uh, Thomas, I'll, I'll handle the unmuting. Um, Thank Ciara, you, Jeff. That's, you are, that's uh, you're unmuted. Unmute. You can ask your question. Hi, you guys. I really enjoyed this so much. I, I really, really became a new fan of your work. So thank you for taking this time. I just wanted to know, a lot of times I get in my head about taking um, photos and during photo shoots, taking too many. So I was just curious, like, how many photos do you take? when you do a specific shoot do you limit yourself because i know you said you don't go longer than about 20 minutes to two hours for a shoot yeah that's a, 
did they get the money shot anyway? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and it's a funny question because once I see the picture I like in the camera, the shoot's over. I don't take another frame. Um, typically, I don't do more than a hundred at the mo at the very, very, very most. The yes I did a shoot yesterday with the Washington Ballet. We took five shots, and out of those five shots, I got the frame I wanted, and I was done. Um, that being said, I usually only give one photo per shoot, unless it's a specific ad campaign or things like that. All of my shoots, I only want one photo out of it because there's always going to be one that's better than the rest. There's always going to be one that stands out, and I don't want to downplay the shoot by just throwing in more content on top of it. If you can't get your story or narrative across with that one frame, then you gotta go back and do it again. Cause one shot should be able to handle the, uh, the weight of the, um, of the, the shoot. Uh, so yeah, typically I don't have more than, I'll say this way, I've been shooting full time now for 11 years. I think in that 11 years, I have 5,000 photos on my hard drives. So mm -hmm. I've done a lot of shoots in that, that, that time frame. I only got about 5,000 photos to, to own up to. And out of those 5,000, like 300 at most that make it to my portfolio. Wow. Wow. Thank you. All right. Sure, thank thank you, you. What's that? I said, thank you, Sierra. Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually have a question for you. Um, sure. And we'll move on to another one after me. I'll do mine fast. Uh, how much influence is Gregory Crudson in your life? Hey, good call. That's a really funny, so yeah, there's, there's like three or four photographers that I really, really admire. He's absolutely one of them. He's fantastic. Um, the Corcoran Institute of Art in DC, when they were, I think, I don't think they're in operation anymore, or I don't know the deals with them. Before I turned 30, uh, they were talking about the most influential photographers under 30, and I was named one of those. And at the time, Gregory was not under 30, but he was also named with me. And I thought that was really, really cool. That's someone who's a big insp uh, inspiration to me. So Gregory Crutzen, amazing. Um, also, I, I guarantee these names will also ring a bell. Dan Winters is a big influence on my work. Um, David LaChapelle, big influence on my work with color theory and things like that. Uh, there's a photographer named Drew Gardner out of the UK, fantastic photographer who takes really cool like, animal portraits in the woods. Um, but those, those names right there are who I always reference. And like, those are the only photographers I've ever really looked at. Like, I know there's a lot of other photographers in the, in the industry who are fantastic, who are legendary. But for me, those guys make me look at their photos just a little bit longer. Like those are the shots that I'm like really just fascinated, especially Crutzen. I've watched Crutzen's documentary a thousand times and it's boring, but man, is it amazing to watch. Amazing. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. And plus he was in a punk rock band. You know that? He was in a Absolutely. band called the Speedies. And I was a, I've been in, a drummer in punk and ska bands my whole life. And when I found that out, I was so impressed. Nice. All right. Oh. Um, let's see. Rafael de la, Lu de, de la Us wants to ask a question of you. Let me get him on real fast. Oh, cool. Here we go. I think Joe just did it. Are you taking control of all of this, Joe? Yeah, uh, Rafael, you, you, can, um, you need to unmute your mic if you're there. All right. Uh, let me let me go ahead and ask for him then. Okay. Uh, so Raphael's question: Where did it go? Where did it go? I just scrolled away from it. Um, do you use light meters to balance your lights, ambience, or just test shots? I get those questions a lot too. I don't, <laughs> and uh, you probably should. Uh, I I know lights. I know exactly what my lights are going to look like as soon as I set them up and what the power sources are going to look like. Um, in the very, 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 very beginning, I was using a, a crummy light meter. I don't know what it was. It was something that was garbage. I got off eBay for like 10 bucks. Yes, you should use light meters. For me, they don't really make, a, they don't make sense because I don't really care what a light meter is going to tell me. I, want, I know what the shot needs to look like. If I want my highlights to blow out, then I want my highlights to blow out. I don't want a light meter to discourage me from that because at the end of the day, you know, using a light meter is like shooting on aperture mode. We want to shoot on manual. You want to make decisions. I don't want a device telling me what decisions I need to make for my shots. Okay, so are you messing around at all with like lighting ratio formulas and, and inverse square stuff? Or, or do you even mess around with that? You just know what's <laughs> going to happen and you set it up. Should I say yes? What, what, the right answer is probably yes. 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I, I know what inverse square law is. I don't know what that is, man. <laughs> I just, it's, it's a little bit of trial and error, you know? Um, it's, you, you start to just kind of know. That's why I use the same modifiers every time. I, I trust them. I know what they look like. I know what they're going to do. Right. Um, but yeah, I, yes, there's ratios involved, but I'm not getting technical. I'm not looking at my ratios and doing math equations on set. That ain't happening. Right. Well, I think once you're experienced enough, you can just do those in your head. You don't really need to even think about it. So yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Let's, uh, let's let Kurth ask a question real quick. Um, I'm going to put Kurth Bob up. Do you want to answer your, or ask your question, sir? It's, it looks like Kurth has logged off. He has logged off. Okay. Uh, his question was, uh, where did it go? It keeps moving me around here. Oh no. His question disappeared when he logged off, I guess. Hmm. Uh, his question was, what types of, he said, what, uh, uh, oh God, I wish I had the whole question in my head. What's uh, your favorite modifier? Lighting modifiers and do you lose, use speed lights at all? Uh, I used to use speed lights. I don't really use them that much anymore. It's just simply they don't work with the Westcott FJ400 system. Okay. Uh, they do have a new thing that they just introduced that will allow other strobes and other excuse me, other speed lights to work within their, their strobe system. Mm -hmm. My favorite modifier is... Small octas, I use them a lot. Uh, I like small modifiers. I like hard, punchy light. None of my also none of my modifiers have a white interior. They're all silver. I want a hard, punchy, contrasty light. And when I say a small octabank, it's maybe like a little two foot guy. That's my it's question. Small. Yeah, it's easy to travel with. I can throw it in my bag and, it, and it's good to go. The biggest modifier I'm ever probably ever use is those six foot parabolics. But that's typically only in a controlled situation. Typically, it's really difficult to use those outside. The smallest amount of wind will just shoot her across the street if I don't have assistance on set. Right. Something else I started doing recently is instead of bringing sandbags, so I, I shoot with C-stands most of the time, which is a pain, but they, they're heavy and they stand up. Uh, I'm starting to carry 10-pound just barbell weights, and you can put them up and over the, the leg of the C-stand, and it just holds way easier, and they're easier to travel with as opposed to a giant sandbag. And they won't spill sand in your car. They won't spill sand. Yeah, just, it's just so much easier. All right, let's see. Um, Paul Gesserich, I think I said it wrong. But anyway, I'm going to put him up and let him ask his question. Paul, are you there? It looks like Paul is logged off. Okay. <laughs> well, then I'll like ask radio real fast. He said, any key fill background ratios you'd like to stick to or stay away from? <laughs> I thought that was a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even understand the question. Um, any key fill ratio? No, just I want my background to be a little bit darker than my key. Uh, that's it. I don't know. Uh, there's no technical things for me. Um, maybe I'm in the minority. Maybe there's photographers out there who have those ratios memorized. I hope not because that just takes the phone out of shooting. Uh, when I first, first, first started, I learned how to shoot on a psych wall and how to blow out the white background so it didn't blow out too far. My background was always two stops brighter than my foreground. Uh, as I've got further into photography, that ratio just kind of went out the window. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So who is still with us? Let's see. How about uh, Pavni Guharoy? Are you still with us, sir? Can you hear me? Hey, oh. ma'am, hey I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is totally fine. Um, so that was a phenomenal presentation. I love seeing you drawing over the photos. I think that provided so much context to the lighting placing. Good. Um, but I guess my question is, uh, I've been in the, in the fear zone of not using lights at all. And my default has been hiding behind natural light. So. Uh -huh. For someone who shoots portraits, um, and context here, I primarily shoot people of color. Um, what is the first step to lighting? Um, what is the first piece of, whether it's a speed light or a soft box, like what do you recommend I start with? 
Sure, that's a good question. So let me ask you this, when you're shooting with natural light, are you shooting this outdoors or are you shooting with like inside of a, a house or something like that? What is your- um, I try to shoot as much uh, indoors, but close to, close to a window so I can, you know, have some sort of control over uh, natural light. Sure, okay, perfect. So then, it, then it's really easy. Uh, let's say you have your subject facing that window or the window, is you're shooting beside them and the window's like right here and you're shooting this way. Does that make sense right. so far? Right. So yep. if you take that same person who's facing this way and you're catching that window light, if you turn them this way and just put another light right here, then yep. you have two lights. You have the light here yep. in the back of their head, and you have a light uh -huh. in the foreground or the, on their face. Uh, so lighting can be really easy. Wherever you're putting your windows on people, just replace that with a light and that will give you a similar effect. Um, okay. As to what to start with, that's hard to say. Uh, I would say the easiest thing to start with is buying some cheap speed lights mm -hmm. uh, and sh using shoot through umbrellas. That's where I think all of us kind of start with uh, artificial lighting, just white translucent umbrellas. They're inexpensive. They'll be kind of annoying to deal with on a windy day. Um, mm -hmm. But if it's you know somewhat manageable, it's fine. That's a beautiful place to start because I think I think as photographers, as we get further into our careers, especially as lighting photographers, we start to discredit the shoot through umbrella. We just, I think there's a time where we just stop using it. I don't know what it is, but we just stop using it. But it really is an effective lighting tool and it can create some really beautiful, pleasing light. And it's very simple to use. Um, a cheap trigger system can be found for any camera out there nowadays for like 20 or 30 bucks. Uh, and it's, it's really is a trial and error thing. If you understand principles of light, and principle meaning you understand where your subject needs to face when it comes to natural light, whether that be a window or under a tree or anything like that. You're never just lighting something, you're just kind of wanting to fill in some shadows. That's all mm -hmm. I'm doing is filling in shadows as much as I can. Um, lighting, like you said, it's, you're, you, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase the way you put it, hiding behind natural light. I think that's normal because natural light's always there. But when you start to incorporate the fact that you can create your own, now natural light is a complement to your, your shoot as opposed to a, a single light source. So I think it's just trial and error. I think it's starting with broad modifiers, meaning larger umbrellas and things. That's easier to manage. It's a more pleasing light. Um, the large octave banks that I've been talking about is typically called cheating light because it looks like beautiful window light coming out of it. So you can't really screw it up. But those... Uh, those shoot through umbrellas are really good. I think that would be the best place to start and, and just trial and error. Just try it on your friends and family and whatnot and see what, how it looks. That's perfect. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Bobney. Do you All find right. that true though? Do you find that people just stop using shoot through umbrellas? There's like yes. a time where it stopped. I, I think for me, the reason I stopped was just lack of control because you put it, it in the room over. and now you have light bouncing all over the place. And if you can't yeah. stop the backside, it's, it's problem. problem. I agree. But I think for a natural light photographer who can't control that light anyways, it's a, it's a nice replacement since Absolutely. it's going to spill everywhere. But yeah, I haven't used a shoot through umbrella in probably a decade. I think I still have <laughs> two somewhere. We all have something somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never use it again. <laughs> all right. Let's see. we got a, a couple more questions. Let's see. Michael Stern. Um, let me see. Are you still here, Michael? I'm going to put you on. My, Michael's uh, not here. <laughs> He's not here. Okay. Well, everybody's leaving us. Let's see. Um, what was your window of time in the portrait of Jim? How early did you begin set up? Nervous time? Yes. Question mark. Got it. Uh, that shoot took 20 minutes. That's at the end of the day, six o'clock. We at, so that assignment was literally shooting every portrait for the entirety of the magazine. The entire month of that publication, I shot every portrait. So we had two days to shoot like 40 portraits, all on location, running around the town, whatever. One of those days, we were there for three days total. One day was all scouting, two days of sun up to sundown shoots in the middle of August in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, How formulaic so that, did it become? What's that? How formulaic did it become? Did you start setting up a way of doing it? 100% formulaic. Everything was three lights. Everything was just run and gun. Gotcha. Um, that traffic cone came out a lot. <laughs> it really, really, really did. So yeah, that's, uh, that's literally, that, that, I think that was the last shoot of that day of shooting. So it's probably closer to 8, 830. Um, so the sun is low as it's probably going to get before, before going down uh, fully. Gotcha. 
All right, uh, let's see. Looks like we have, all right, we have one from an anonymous question. I'm just gonna ask you real fast, let you answer real fast, because it's, cool. it's almost not photography related, but uh, what did you use to create the presentation? It, this person says oh. it's not PowerPoint. So what'd you use? I don't wanna give away my secrets. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's uh, Prezi, P-R-E-Z-I, Prezi. Okay. Good. Uh, then we have one more question. We'll take one more question and then oh. uh, and then wrap it up. Let's see. It's uh, Stephen Bob. Are you are you with us, Stephen? Uh, unmute your microphone. Joe, can you unmute him? We might have lost Joe. Uh, yeah. No. He's he's got to unmute his his microphone. I'm... Okay. If he doesn't come here in a second, I will go ahead and just read off his question. Um, he wanted to know, or uh, it's a little off topic, he says. I don't think it is. I think it's really important. Are you shooting tethered? No. Um, I have the location that four. Yeah, yeah. So the way I usually tether is I do, I shoot Canon stuff. I use their Wi-Fi to tether into a, iPad that my client can hold just to see the photos. Um, if I'm doing a bigger, bigger project, I did a, a big ad campaign for the American Dental Association, Dental Association, where we actually were shooting tethered into a laptop and editing as we went. More often than not, I'm my shoots are quick and I want them to be quick. So having the Wi-Fi tether is usually really cool. Also, I like to joke around with my clients, but hey, you can take the picture too. And I just hold up my camera and they can just press the little button on the iPad and they take a picture and they get all excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you that's, know, a, that's a quality thing, man. That's a good thing. interactive. Now, now they get to do the, the photos. Uh, so I just usually tether into an iPad just to get a somewhat of an idea of what the, the shot's going to look like later. And then if I need to go any further with that, I'll pull it off and then uh, throw it into Snapseed to do a quick edit on it. For social media or whatever. Yeah, perhaps. yeah, yeah. So uh, do you find the Wi-Fi uh, tethering is, is relatively slow or does it move pretty well? Uh, I think it's like light years faster than tethering into a, a computer really? it's fast okay. it's literally like within a second i can get that thing to pop up on the I've ipad been tethering into, into laptops forever and i tried once to do the wi-fi and i just couldn't get it to work right and you know no you just once, move on once you get the wi-fi to work it is it's a champ it's it's a workhorse it really is gotcha all right well i think uh, that's it i don't see any more here and it looks like we're out of time so um cool let's see you know i forgot to put up your your information. So while I say this last bit, I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, screen with your Instagram. And okay. I do have a battery flashing at me, but we should still be okay. Okay. This will take just a minute. Yeah, you're fine. All right. Um, I, uh, you see up on the screen here, we have his information. So uh, you can get a hold of Jonathan or go follow him. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I want to thank Jonathan specifically for this amazing tutorial. I can't wait to thank try you. out some of the stuff you've talked about today. Awesome. Um, we couldn't have made, th this couldn't have been made possible without you. And uh, of course, without Tamron, our sponsor, hold on, gonna get to my Tamron logo. There we go. Without Tamron and, uh, without you two, it wouldn't have been possible. Let's see. Um, don't forget to join us next week and Jonathan will be back and I think I'll be back with him and, uh, Oh, cool. He will be talking about in the studio. Well, not talking. You'll, you're will you actually going to do like a live crazy studio thing, right? Yeah, I'm doing a live shoot next week. It will be a full production, full lit, similar to what we're looking at actually today on this shot. Very similar lighting, um, full concept, the whole nine. Excellent. Man, that's, so, that's yeah, please tune in next week. It'll be fun. I'll have someone monitoring my camera and they'll be able to answer questions too and ask me and I'll have a mic in my ear and everything. So I'll be able to hear everything going on. Very cool. Very cool. And you said you're going to have a cameraman also, right? Yep. It's all that's, going to be going on. That's going to be fun. All right. Full thing. <laughs> well, all of that said, do you want to add anything? No. Uh, check me out on Instagram. Follow me there. Jthorpe Photo. Twitter is Jthorpe Photo. Everything is Jthorpe Photo. Um, feel free to please hit me up if you have questions. I'm always going to answer. I'm always available. And I guys, thank you all so much to Focus on the Story and Tamron. And I hope you all uh, learned something today. Thank you, Jonathan. It was fantastic. Have a great one. Thanks, you Take too, care, man. everyone.